Today is March 19th, 2024, and my guest is psychologist Michael Norton, the Harold M. Brierley Professor of Business Administration at Harvard Business School. He is the author of The Ritual Effect, From Habit to Ritual, Harness the Surprising Power of Everyday Actions. And that book is our topic for today. Michael, welcome to Econ Talk. Russ, thanks so much for having me. Let's start with um, the difference between habit and ritual. And I would, I'm going to throw in routine. It's not your subtitle, but you do talk about routine. So we have, as individuals, we have habits, we have routines, and we have rituals. Uh, they are somewhat similar, but they have very, very important differences. That's right. I think that um, sometimes we use the word habit to refer to rituals. Sometimes we use ritual to refer to habit. And so we have been trying in our research to tease apart, really, what are the differences between these? And I do think, as you said, that it ends up being quite important. So for me, habits and routines are things that are a bit dry. They're unemotional. They're tasks that we need to get done. And when we do them, we can check them off our list. And good habits are great. I'm not anti-habit in any way. I should have better habits. You know, I should exercise more and things like that. But they are kind of a box checking exercise often. Rituals, I think, are a bit more emotional and a bit more meaningful. They have more in them than just checking off a box. And a, a silly example that I use, but it does, I do think it highlights something is if I ask people, do you brush your teeth first and then shower, or do you shower and then brush your teeth? First off, weirdly, about half of people do one <laughs> and half of people do the other. But the important thing is if I say, hey, you know, tomorrow morning or tonight before you go to bed, could you switch the order? And about half of people say, sure, no problem. And what would you say? Uh, I would say that would be weird. It would be weird. They say weird, odd, I don't want to. And if I say why, they say, I don't, I don't know exactly, but I don't want to. And for me, that's starting to get the difference between a habit and a ritual. So if you can flip the order of those, you know, they're, they're habits, they're tasks. You just got, you got to clean your face, you got to clean your body, whatever. But if the order matters to you, if for some reason you feel like, mm, I'd rather do that than that, than that, it's starting to be a bit more ritualistic because you can feel emotion in you as you think about it in a way that you might not with habits. Now, when I say ritual, I don't mean people in robes with candles. That's, that's very far down the continuum from habit to ritual. But as soon as we start to have that extra emotion, that feeling, that meaning, that preference to do it one way versus the other, I think we're moving toward more ritualistic and away from kind of a dry habit. And then a routine would be, to me, it's more like um, I brush my teeth every twice a day is my routine. The habit is I do it after I shower. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just had to think there for a minute. And the ritual would be I, um, I have an incantation, I say, when I spread the toothpaste in, onto, the, uh, onto the toothbrush and I brush a certain number of times that evokes the infinity of the universe, and et cetera. <laughs> that's, that's far down the continuum, I, I think, for sure. But even, even with something, for example, like how you brush your teeth. It turns out that we have preferences for that. So if, if you think of brushing your teeth, if you do it next time, you start in the same place, you do things, you end in the same place, and that also feels good. Now, you could brush your teeth in any order you want. <laughs> the point is to get them clean. But we have these feelings that if we do it in this particular way, in the way that I like to do it, it feels different to us. And that, again, is more than just a habit. It's doing something else for us that's a bit more emotional. But I, you know, I want to disagree a little bit, which is kind of absurd. You wrote a book on ritual and I didn't, <laughs> but um, habits are things we become accustomed to. And why that is the case, I think, is fascinating. Um, my 20-month-year-old uh, granddaughter must start her breakfast with a banana mm -hmm. and will be the person who tries to provide an apple or the oatmeal before the banana. And uh, those are habits to me. She has emotions about them. But for me, ritual is more about meaning. Now, I think your book is about different kinds of rituals, which is why you're allowed to call them whatever you want. But make a distinction between rituals that have emotional resonance with us, but also have, I think there is a category of ritual that's deeper. I think that's true. I mean, I think if you think of the word 
ritual. So there's overlap between rituals and habits as we're discussing right now. But the word ritual is used for many things that really don't have much to do with habits at all. So for example, a wedding is a ritual. And hopefully we're not making a habit <laughs> out of having, you know, a wedding every week with a new person or something like that. Funerals are a ritual. So the, the rituals are this very broad, to your point, a very broad, very emotional category of activities humans engage with. Some of them are at a cultural level. Some of them have, you know, deep religious meaning, but some of them are these little ones that people do in their everyday lives that aren't at the scale of ones with long history, but they do still have a little bit of that emotion and meaning in them. We prefer to do it this way because I'll feel ready to start the day if I brush my teeth this way versus that way. But why is it, and you talk about athletes who have extended rituals for their either preparation for performance, either in the sports or in music, uh, in the case of musical performers, wh why do you think we like them? Uh, one thing that's nice about your book is it forces you to recognize there's rituals all around that are not religious, which is our usual connotation of the word. Uh, but why are they comforting? Why does my granddaughter, for example, love her rituals? Why did my children love the rituals? In fact, to the point where, uh, you know, it's multi-step. It's not the banana starts the thing. Bedtime had a very fixed rhythm to it. Why do you think human beings like that? And why do athletes find that? calming, which is, I think, the main reason uh, they they perform these rituals. I, I have to say that um, when I started studying rituals, I was doing it from a kind of removed scientific standpoint, studying what other people were doing, <laughs> as uh, scientists sometimes do. Yeah. And when my wife and I had our daughter, we immediately, you know, you take a kid home from the hospital and suddenly you're responsible for a human, and the, one of the things they need to do is sleep. We immediately, we didn't think of it as a ritual. We didn't use the word ritual, but in retrospect, it was like this stuffed animal, then this song, then we'll do this book, you know, then we'll yeah. have this little snack and then we'll do that book. And then this other song, we really turned to just like with your granddaughter, ritualistic behavior to try to ease her to sleep. And I think, I believe that it helped her sleep, but what I do know is it very much helped us cope with the stress because it's so, uh, chaotic, you know, when you have a baby, everything's brand new to you. And that I think is telling that we kind of thought we were doing it for her, but a little bit, <laughs> we were doing it to help us manage our own stress. And you do see in the research that as things become more stressful, people are more likely to bring ritual to bear. So it's almost as though we have within us a sense of as things get very, very stressful, let's pull ritual as one, we can use many tools, you know, we can take medication, there's all kinds of things we can use. But one of the things that we use now and throughout history is ritual. We, we turn to them, we create them, we rely on them in these moments of stress. Yeah, you know, obviously, ritual is when we're autonomous as adults, not as children, but I think it works the same for children. It's a form of control in an uncontrolled world. Uh, I like to joke that when you get sent home from the hospital with the kid, they don't give you a manual. There's a lot of That's books. Right. <laughs> there's, there's plenty of books on it. it. They don't help much. They help a little bit. Don't want to say not at all, but there's no real manual. Um, and I've never told a expectant parent, oh, you know, you're going to want to have a bedtime ritual. I think every parent finds out that they have one very quickly. Yes. And one of the reasons I find out is that if you deviate from it, you will be uh, shouted down uh, from the heavens by a very <laughs> small but very loud creature who is announcing a violation, literally a violation, um, an unacceptable uh, break in routine, and which is effectively becomes a ritual. Um, and I wonder if how much that is the chaotic nature of you think your life's chaotic think about your your kid who was in the womb no worries nothing to ever think about and all of a sudden is in this very bright world with um people in it yeah so maybe rituals for for newborns and we, we never quite lose this are our way of coping with the loss of control i don't know yeah and you we do see um for example that um a thing that we're not built to do as humans, unfortunately, is just to tell ourselves to feel a certain way, and then we can feel that way. 
it would be great if we worked that way, but we don't. So if I'm very, very anxious about something, I can't magically just say, calm down. And immediately I'm calm. I wish I could, but it's just not how we're built. And so we do all kinds of things to try to get that sense of calm. And again, you know, medication, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, there's many, many things that humans have come up with to help us. But as you said, I think in these moments where everything is chaotic, one of the things that we say is let's do something orderly and repeated and see if that can help us get a little bit more sense of uh, having a grip on things. Yeah, the um, that inability to take suggestions from yourself, which should be a piece of cake, right? If it's irrational to be nervous, reminding yourself of that doesn't help. On, on, which is fasc always fascinating to me. But I want to ask you a question about athletes. It's a little bit off the off the subject. Um, Wade Boggs, baseball player you mentioned, very, very into rituals. Um, you only scratch the surface, as I'm sure you know. Um, he ate chicken before every meal. He had to make certain Hebrew letters in the dirt with his bat. I mean, he was a strange person at least in his rituals um yeah. but he's really good at what he does he's in the hall of fame now he did fail two out of three times that's the nature of being a baseball hitter but i always find it fascinating that certain performers are terrified despite being at a world-class level while i suspect and i might be wrong others are more relaxed um, are there any great musical performers, you think, or great athletes who don't get nervous? I'm trying to think if we came across any who have no no sense of nerves before these big performances. I think that, um, you know, there's been, for example, studies of baseball players. Wade Boggs is one of the extreme examples, but but there are other extreme examples Another Red Sox player, Nomar Garcia Parra, was famous for his very yep. elaborate rituals when he was hitting. The study showed, so they they videotaped baseball players at bat, and they found that they made an average of 83 movements. Now, that's a lot of moves, and that's for each time they're going to swing. You know, tapping the plate, touching the glove. You can think of all these movements that you would count. And, of course, they're very regular, right? So you're, if you do 83, you kind of do the same 83 each time. But there's variance in it, you know, so some people do many fewer movements, some people do more movements. So I do think there's a sense that some people use it more or have more elaborate rituals than others. But I don't know of any really high class performer. I've not come across one who doesn't have something at least that they do some some little preference or way that they do things or how they put their shoes on or how they walk on stage that isn't a little bit ritualistic in the sense that they could put their shoes on any way they want. You know, they could walk on stage from the right instead of the left, but they just really want to do it, you know, the way that they've done it for years and years. It just makes them feel, okay, I've got this. I'm ready to go. Man, I'm thinking about somebody like Yo-Yo Ma, the greatest, one of the greatest cellists of our time, uh, versus, say, Mark Knopfler, one of my favorite guitarists. Mm -hmm. Are they both? Mark Knopfler looks very relaxed up there. So does Yo-Yo Ma, to be honest. But I have a feeling Yo-Yo Ma has a lot of rituals that I wonder if Mark Knopfler does. I don't know. Does he have anxiety before he goes on stage that his solos are not going to be as good uh, as they should be? I don't know. Uh, maybe it's improv versus, you know, st you know, following a set um, sc score. But and it seems kind of strange. Yeah, I think one of the things that's interesting is um, – often these performers these elite elite performers they look perfectly calm because they really are very very good at what they're doing so he's you know as you said why would wade boggs be nervous about hitting <laughs> he's one of the greatest hitters ever why would mark knopfler ever be nervous about it? he's an amazing guitarist and yet sometimes we see that it's these elite performers that rely on rituals even more than me who has the pretty not very stressful life at all so even though they're way better at things than me they actually are still bringing more ritual to bear often, I think, in order to cope with the massive uncertainty that they have to experience. If my class doesn't go well today, not that huge of a deal. If Mark Knopfler falls on stage, it's on YouTube all over the world, you know, for the rest of yeah. his life. So I do think that we we do in a bit and of a funny way, we ratchet it up when the stress gets more and more uh, intense. Just to make one 
last uh, Boston sports reference, and we'll move away from both Boston and athletes. Larry Bird was famous as a trash talker. Uh, I think in his first three-point shooting con- uh, contest in the locker room with the other perform- the other contestants, he said very calmly, who's playing for second? And just let it lay there. And he did win. You know, he was yeah. the best three-point shooter of, of that group. And it, he proved it, uh, at least in that small sample. But it's a fascinating thing that he exuded. He was famous for being calm on the court. But it's very possible, now that I think about it, your insights, that his trash talking was his way, was his ritual of calming his own nerves. Um, you know, it's a bit of imposter syndrome. You know, he's all, an athlete, I think, often has to face the reality that maybe they're not what they used to be or today they won't be at the level they want to be. And there's luck. And luck is painful. So trash talking as well as the kind of glove adjusting, et cetera, of a, of a baseball hitter. Um, some of that maybe is just a way to assert, again, to assert control in a situation that's actually unbearable. And mm-hmm. the calmest ones might be the most nervous. McCall's yeah, appearing that, ones. I think that can be true. I, I promise we'll get off Boston sports, but, <laughs> but Tom Brady was very well known for being incredibly calm under extreme pressure. You know, yeah. in his seventh Super Bowl, he wasn't as rattled as someone in their first Super Bowl. And so, again, you might think, I bet he's calm all the time. I bet he never uses ritual. But there are funny stories. Early in his career, uh, they were on a losing streak. Uh, they took the game ball and Bill Belichick buried it. And Brady went over and kicked it. They like kicked the dirt as if to say, we're leaving that football and that game behind us. That's very, very, you know, very, very ritualistic. And he was using it there actually not to calm down before a game, but using a ritual to let something go and see if he could yeah. move forward. So even people who are calm and don't necessarily use them to calm down can use them in many other domains of life, which I find very interesting. Yeah. Um, let's talk about how different rituals do different things. And I, I I was surprised, unless I maybe I missed it, but I, I don't think you talked about making tea. Uh, you, you talk about coffee at some point, but you know, in, in Buddhism, tea making is is a thing. Uh, doing the dishes is a thing, and, and you do these things in a certain ritual manner to clear your head. And the goal of the ritual is merely by focusing on the steps in and of themselves, the way I understand it, you are clearing your head. Do you think that's true? And is that important? There is some data that, so if you think about when you are nervous and you engage in a ritual, why it might calm you down. One reason that it can calm you down is it actually clears your mind of some of the anxious thoughts because there's literally no room for them. Because if I'm having to keep something in mind, I need to do this, then I need to do that. The seventh step from now is this, so I better do this now. It's just harder for me to keep saying, you're gonna blow it, you're gonna blow it, you're gonna blow it, because my voice is taken up by the rituals that I'm doing. And so there is some evidence that part of why they're helpful is that in fact, they just occupy us, move us away from the negative emotions we might be having, and just free us up a little bit to be in the moment rather than be worried about the moment. Now, your book focuses on the, there are some religious examples in your book, but most of your book is about non-religious examples. Religious examples throughout most of history were about either connecting to the divine as perceived by the person doing them or connecting to your tribe. They're about belonging because you're doing things that you're, the other adherents are doing, and thereby you feel a part of something larger than yourself. Most of those religious rituals are unavailable to many people today uh, because they don't have the belief. What do you think substitutes for that? What rituals are people using to fill that particular uh, gap that I think is a very human one that people want to fill? Uh- Absolutely. I mean, if you look, you know, in human history, it's extraordinary that every culture and every religion has developed rituals that reflect the values of the culture or the values of the religion, very, very different from each other, exactly what the rituals are. And yet the impulse is there to develop these to kind of say, this is who we are. I do think that when we lose some of those rituals, um, 
we could just say, well, that's fine. We don't need them, but it doesn't seem to be what humans do. It seems like we come up with new ones, which again, I think is kind of suggesting there's something in us that really likes these. Like a um, one example would be something like Burning Man, where that's not religious. It's not a thousand years old, but you know, you do a pilgrimage to a desert with like-minded people in order to connect, and then you burn a figure you know, at the end, it's it's very, very ritualistic. It, it doesn't have the element of faith that some other rituals do. But I also think at a more local level, I think people through time, of course, but have their own family rituals. And those family rituals can do many of the same things, right? They can give you meaning. They can give you a sense of place. They can give you a sense of history. You know, this, when we make this apple pie, that is my great, great grandmother's recipe. By making that pie, I'm actually connecting myself back generations in my family in a way that's hard to do without having some of these rituals in place. So we do at a kind of at a more micro level, create very similar things with our family dynamics in order, I think, to have those same kinds of feeling of, of connectedness, of meaning, of belonging. And we do see in the research, family rituals do make people, you know, families with rituals do feel closer together to each other than families that lack rituals. Now, Mourning, dealing with death is an obvious case where through all of every culture, as you say, every every religion has not just rituals around mourning, but often very elaborate ones. Uh, I re vividly remember talking to Michael Brendan Doherty about his book. Uh, I think I might get the name wrong. My father left me Ireland. Is that the name of it? I hope, hope that's the name of it. I'll look it up later and we'll correct it in the notes if I got it wrong. Um, but he didn't have Irish, he had Irish roots. His father was from Ireland, his mother was from Ireland, but she moved to, to the United States and he didn't get passed on any Irish traditions and he resented it deeply. And I said, you know, well, in a way you'd think it'd be better because then you could just choose the best one when, you, when somebody dies. You don't have to be stuck with awake and other Irish habits. You could choose your, your own, pick, the, pick a Native American, piece from there and another piece from, from Buddhism. And, but of course, we want our morning rituals and uh, we want our grandmother's, great-great-grandmother's cake, not your great-great-grandmother's cake, even if it tastes better than mine. Yes. I don't care. How strange is that? It's, it's, it's very interesting, right? I mean, that we, uh, if you think of, of mourning, what are we using rituals for when we mourn? We're using them for lots of things, but one of the things we're using them for, for many people, they're using them to connect to their faith and help them deal with their grief through faith. But for many, many people, what they do is they offer, in a sense, an obligation. You could say an excuse to get together, or you could say an obligation to get together, where everyone who knew this person has to come and gather on this day because our faith or our culture says, no, two days after or five days after, or one day before the funeral, we do this, you know, different cultures have different ways of dealing with grief, but you have to do it. And I think if you think of grief as a lot of it is internal, you know, you're just coping with your own grief, but a lot of it is social. We need social support to get through grief and funerals are in a sense, they make everyone who we love gather around us at least for one day. And I think that's very, very powerful. And to your point, when we lose those, we don't just say, well, no more rituals, you know, no more religious rituals, so let's not have anything. People come up with a different kind of non-religious service, a memorial service to serve the same function. So even though the traditional ritual might not be in place, it's as though we're aware as humans, you know what, these are very, very important to do these things when someone passes away. Let's develop our own to make sure that we have some of these features in place. Uh, two of my favorite stories in the book, are uh, related to death and and mourning. Um, talk about what happened to Mike Brick, the musician, when he when he was dying. So fascinating. I mean, we think of death and and memorials. Literally, memorial service is is memory, meaning the person is gone, and we remember them. And people make you know wonderful speeches about how meaningful this person was in their life and how much they loved them. And Mike Brick, when he was diagnosed with cancer, they started planning something like that. And then suddenly they said, why would we do this after you're gone? <laughs> you know, why would everyone stand up and say how much they loved you when you're not there anymore? 
And it, I mean, once you hear that, you say, my goodness, that's so obvious. Of course that we, we should have, I don't know what they, they're not memorial, they're pre-memorial or whatever we might call them. And that's exactly what they did. Instead of doing it after, they created this ceremony before where they could really do all the things that they loved, include, including play music. And I think it's such a wonderful example of rethinking what we are trying to do when we are going to be faced with grief. Absolutely, there is nothing wrong with waiting until the person is gone and then having a funeral or another service. Of course, it could be incredibly meaningful for people, but we also have other opportunities. And I think that Mike Brick and his wife said, we could still do that if we want to, but why don't we also do something while you're still here to honor you before you go? You know, when I read that story, I found it so moving. I, it, you know, brought tears to my eyes. And and now that you're telling it, I'm thinking, but what did they do when he did die? That's my first thought, which, of course, I'm sure they had a funeral. He uh, was, was actually a, Catholic, so they had they did have a Catholic mass in, in the uh, kind of traditional way. So they, the, interestingly, to your earlier point, they did a little bit of both. They relied on religious, religious rituals and expressed their faith, and they also developed their own novel ritual to get some of these other elements as well. And I've never been to anything like that pre-memorial. Uh, and part of me is thinking, oh, it must have been very incredibly sad. Uh, it was bittersweet. It's one of the things that that I think are some of the best moments in our lives or the mixture of bitter and sweet. So here's a person who's dying, who's performing a song with his band that everyone loves and realizing they'll never hear it again from that person. And that's heartbreaking. Uh, at the same time, <clears throat> and you think, well, how could that have been an enjoyable yeah. experience? And yet, uh, it's all of life. All of life is, you know, you say, well, you couldn't have enjoyed it. He's going he's gonna to die soon, but we're all going to die soon. And, you know, enjoying and, and feeling the joy of being with dozens, if not hundreds of people that love you and that you love uh, is special. Doing it two weeks before you die versus two months before you die versus two years before you die, really, it's kind of the same parade. I don't know. One of the things that this research on rituals has has really made me rethink is, in fact, the timing of them. You know, when do we do them and when do we not do them? You know, even something like uh, a wedding anniversary. We got married on this date in June, whatever it might be. And then every year on that date, we do something. But why only do it once a year? You know what I mean? We're not bound to only celebrate our marriage once a year. We can do it whenever we want. Or I think of retirement ceremonies. You know, people stand up and say, this woman was the greatest boss I ever had. She completely changed my life on the last day that this woman is ever going to work for the company. What a funny thing. To do. <laughs> Why not say it a year before or five years before how much people mean to us? So I, you can see why these things are in place with the timing that they have. But I do think we have lots of opportunities to insert other practices to do things before people are going to leave or before things happen to honor them and express gratitude and enjoy them and enjoy being with each other. Yeah, my wedding anniversary is June 25th, which means uh, my half anniversary is December 25th. Uh -huh. And being Jewish, December 25th, you know, it's a nice day, but <laughs> it's a free it's, day. <laughs> now it's my, it's my half anniversary, and it looks like the world's lit up. Just look at all those special lights for us. Uh, I love but we that. do try to I think about that. it. It's kind of sweet. It's terrific. What, what are your rituals, Michael? Uh, I'm sure you realized you had some you didn't have uh, once you wrote this book or when you started this research. Do you have rituals you could share? We've um, for sure had had and have rituals with our daughter is now eight, but we have and had rituals at her bedtime for sure. They get less and less as kids get older and learn how to sleep on their own. Again, yeah. showing how we calibrate rituals, you know, to the size of the need. Um, but we had things like one of the things that she used to do <laughs> was I would be carrying her up to her bedroom and she would say good night to the stairs. That became a thing. And I, as the stairs, would have to say good night. Now, where, you know, how did that, where did that come? I have absolutely no idea what started that. And yet it became something that we got to do every night. And if we forgot to do it, let's go back down the stairs, say goodbye to the stairs, you know, say goodnight to the stairs and then go back. So in these very little ways, I think as I started to look, almost literally look down at myself, like, what am I doing right now? You start to see, you know, and I do have some, not everything I do is a ritual, obviously, but I do have some things 
that I really do pretty regularly that matter a lot. They have meaning in them and emotion in them. And they're doing something for me. You know, I'm, I I could skip them if I want. I All I need to do is take her up the stairs. I don't need to say goodnight to the stairs. But something about those actions makes them a bit different, makes them a little more emotional, I think. And, you know, there's something, going back to the bittersweet, the poignance of life. And there comes a point where you can't carry her on your shoulder and you'll still be thinking about those stairs and it'll be so bittersweet it's as sweet and as bitter as life can be so special i i teach a class with um of undergraduates of actually freshmen in college about rituals it's a kind of a discussion class and one of the things that i ask them to do is um call up their parents or i guess facetime i don't know but anyway (laughs) contact their parents and ask them these these kids are 18 and ask their parents hey do you remember what you did when I was, you know, a baby or a toddler to get me to sleep. And they say their parents immediately start crying. Yeah. You know, immediately. They remember every single thing. You know what I mean? Every single, every parent remembers all the things. And just to your point, it's incredibly wonderful memories of your child being that little. And, you know, you can look at pictures and you can think of them, but some of these rich little ritualistic practices they really do bring it back in a very different way. You can remember how heavy your kid was when you were carrying them from, you know, it really, really can come back to you when you think back to these rituals that you randomly created about saying goodnight to the stairs. That's for me now a lifetime of amazing memory that I created, even though I recognize it's completely crazy, you know, to do something like that. It's not crazy if I get this much out of it. And there's things that, I wouldn't call them rituals, but there's, you you do talk about it, at least as ritualistic. The um, the book the vocabulary we develop with our spouse, or partner, or with our children, and it comes from the poems we read to them, the books we read to them, the movies we watch together, and then sometimes just inexplicable things that we can't mm-hmm. like you you can't remember why you say things you do that it just becomes those are mostly habit but they do have such a richness to them that they're much more than a habit and you do also see for example that parents typically don't use the same nickname for each of their kids that's that's kind of a little offensive right yeah why is it offensive i don't know but it feels offensive and we also you know when couples have little nicknames for each other and the relation you know schmooper bear or whatever funny things we say <laughs> If somebody were to reuse that in their next relationship, oh my god! Just right, you're you're just not allowed to do that it's because exactly. I mean, truly a violation. It's exact. You know, your your ex is allowed to date other people and even marry them, but they are not allowed to use your pet nickname no, with no, that no. person. <laughs> that that is off limits. And I think to, exactly to your point, these small words carry so much meaning in them. You know that we remember them forever and get upset if things change. Yeah, Dana Joya, who the poet, um, has a beautiful poem on this. I'm, I'm not going to read it, but we'll uh, link to that episode about the, which he, he read the poem on that episode about the private mm-hmm. language that couples have that's physical. The way they interact with each other physically is obviously a set of habits and habits and routines, but that's much more than habits and routines. It becomes deeply related to how we see another person and how we mm. how we feel about them, care about them, love them, and so on. Um, now you write about Ulay and uh, Marina Abramovich, and I've forgotten how to pronounce her name, so it's either Abramovich or Abramovich. But uh, we've talked about her on the program before uh, about her um, the movie that was made of her a time when she sat for hours in one place and people came by and just sat across from her for a period of time. And hundreds of people lined up just to stare in her eyes. But I, I want you to set this up and talk about their relationship because I did not know that backstory. We'll bring it back to the sitting down thing. But tell us about the, the, the ritualistic nature. Oh, my gosh. They're extraordinary. This is, I think, um, one of the most interesting couples that uh, I came across, <laughs> let's say, in my research. All couples, as we just discussed, have their own little ecosystem of language and movements and things like that these two really took it to an extreme because nearly everything that they did was a highly highly elaborate ritual my favorite one was when the relationship was ending 
what do you do? Usually you say, uh, you know, good luck, here's your stuff. They decided that they would start at opposite ends of the Great Wall of China <laughs> and walk to the middle. And when they got there, that would be the end of the relationship. Now, the Great Wall of China is very, in fact, it's called a Great Wall. It's very, very long. So what are they doing? Why would they start at opposite ends and meet in the middle? Of course, partly it's, you know, a spectacle and interesting that they would do that. But you can think about the process that they were going through in their heads on that long walk, knowing that it was ending at the end of it. It's very, very different than if they just sat down at a coffee shop and ended it. They're doing something very special, I think, reflecting on the relationship as they walk so that when they meet in the middle, they really, I think, are ready to let it go, even though they were so incredibly close. And of course, everyone now, when they want to break up with their, their partner, goes to the Great Wall of China. It's, it's, That's right. <laughs> it's a ritual that didn't quite catch on. I it's hundreds of millions of couples. What? <laughs> hundreds of millions of oh, couples yeah. It's are an annual thing. They do it on a certain day. <laughs> um, but the, when they met, they realized that they shared rituals that were the same before they met, right? They wrote little words on a piece of paper that were in common. They had these very tiny, tiny examples of just being exactly the same person that became very, very, for them felt th the idea that we share these must mean something more than just a random coincidence. It must mean something a little bit karmic, you know, or magical. And many of us do that in our relationships. You know, if you, if you find out you like the same band, obscure band as someone, <laughs> It really feels magical. You know, you, you feel like, my God, and then you can go to the concert together and that's magical for you as well. So we create, you know, and then you go every year on your anniversary or whatever, or whatever it might be. We build in to these, theirs was very extreme, but we do see in our research that all of us have these little things that we build into it that really become us and make us different from other relationships. So just to close out, Ule and uh, I think it's Ule and Marina, uh, in in her experience of sitting for, I think it was something like eight hours a day for, I don't know how many days, a lot of days, where all she did was sit and be stared at by a person across from her, and she stared back in return. And I've always loved this. When you tell it to some people, they go, well, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. And yet the very phenomenon of being seen uh, and the attempt to connect visually with another human being is very powerful. And and many people in that encounter wept in her presence. But the part that's crazy, and I appreciate now more because of your book, is, and I don't know if it was staged or not, because they're performance artists, Ula and Marina. Mm -hmm. They did a lot of performance art together, uh, as you write about. But he shows up in the chair across from her, and it, it seems to be without warning. I don't know if that's real or re or staged, but as far as I think it's described, she did not know. He, she had not, After that Great Wall of China thing, they didn't talk for how long? Do you remember? I can't remember. Many, many years. It was decades. Yeah. I think it was 22 yeah. years. They didn't. Not only did they not, quote, run into each other, catch up, say hello, uh, they didn't communicate, I think, at all. And maybe until this moment. When Ule comes unexpectedly, at least in the way it's told, and sits across from her and just, you know, tears run down her face. It's it's mm -hmm. a it's an incredible moment. I recommend that documentary. I'll put the link to a link up to it if if you haven't seen it out there. Um uh, let's talk about work. Uh we don't think about work as a ritual place. We think about maybe church, you know, religious houses of worship. Uh we might think about our hearth. Mm -hmm our homestead, where we have some of the family rituals you've alluded yep. to. Certainly, we have incredible rituals around holidays, mostly food-related. Work seems like to be the last place for ritual, and yet that's not the case. So talk about rituals at work. This was a bit of a surprising um, realization that, that eventually became obvious, but I really wasn't thinking we'd, we'd see a lot, I guess, in, in the workplace because it's work. It's not home, it's not connection with people we love and all the other things that we've been talking about. But then if you think about how people scaffold their day, their work day, it's extremely ritualistic. So you have, you know, in the morning, you have to transition from your home self to your work self. You, sometimes you have a commute that gives you some time to kind of transition, you know, from being 
goofy dad to having to teach a class. Those are slightly different roles. So I need to do something to go from dad to professor on the way there. And many people report doing something that gets them ready to go. They're literally, and even back to toothbrushing and showering, when you do it in the order you like, you say, I feel ready for the day. When people get to work, they often have a very specific order of things. You know, they settle in at their desk. Some people do, you know, email, then chat with coworker, then coffee. Other people say it's got to be coffee first and then this and this. So we kind of bookend the morning to separate these things. At work, when we're stressed out, people often do, as we not not the professional athlete level of, of rituals, but people will do their own little ritual to calm themselves before a big meeting. Typically go into the bathroom and, and shout at yourself in the mirror, <laughs> make sure nobody's in there and say, you know, you can do this. It's very, very common, actually. Then we have our team rituals at work, which we can talk about a little bit as well. Not team rituals like uh, screaming and shouting, but little practices that we have in our team that make us who we are. And then at the end of the day, when we leave work, we have to transition back from work self to home self. And people often do things there as well. We did a study with emergency room nurses, extremely stressful job, incredibly hard to leave work behind when you're in that kind of job. And they tell us that they have sometimes very elaborate rituals to try to leave work behind so that they can go back and have a really nice dinner with their family. Yeah, but talk about those team ones that you that you mentioned. We asked uh, people in teams, um, Not we don't usually say, do you have any rituals? Because that's kind of a leading question. But we'll ask questions like, you know, is there anything that you your team does regularly that uh, is kind of distinctive to you and either fun or meaningful? And some teams say, nope, <laughs> they say nothing at all. And that's the kind of what we thought we'd see at work, which is just it's a bunch of people in there. I got to work with them. Don't care about it. You know, some people, one guy, when we asked that question wrote, I do my work and then I go home. <laughs> that was the only, the only response to this question. But other teams say things like, you know what? We actually do have something. One team that I, that stands out to me is a, it was a five person team. And they decided that um, what they would do is each person was responsible for lunch one day of the week for the team. And they would rotate you know, which day it was for each person. And they did it for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. They kept doing this thing. Now, what are they doing? They, you're going to eat lunch. <laughs> you know, we all can grab a sandwich. But as a team, amazingly, what they're doing is each person's taking care of the team one day of the week. It's the same amount of money. It's the same amount of food. It's the same amount of time even that they're together. But they've changed it by this ritual into something that means something much more than the team. And we do see when we ask, you know, if you have a ritual with your team versus not, teams that say, you know, we actually do something like that tend to be more satisfied and see more meaning than people who say, I just do my work and go home. And of course, an economist, not being a normal human being, might, not being a good economist, might say, well, <laughs> it's more efficient. Because when you're making five sandwiches all at the same time, you can lay out the bread and open, only open the mustard once and do all five. And then it's easier. Therefore, there's economies of scale. And so it's a transactional interaction that's done for efficiency purposes. But you did not describe it that way, strangely enough, because you're not an economist and you're probably a normal human being. <laughs> you said they take turns taking care of each other. And of course, they're both true. Yes. But one of them uplifts and the other doesn't. <laughs> and, you know, I think it's important, too, because um, uh, we don't have a lot of time. We don't have a lot of free time in our lives, most of us at this point. And so if I were to say, you know, what's great uh, at work is to take four hours every day and do this thing. It's just you just can't you know, there's no there's no way to do it. But what we often find is that people are building them into things that are already happening. You know, so lunch is happening full stop. It's just you got to have lunch. So it doesn't take more time actually to engage in this, but by changing it in these different ways, it actually becomes something much more meaningful. And I think for me, one of the things that's most fascinating about rituals is we take really mundane things and turn them into saying goodnight to the stairs, the stairs suddenly, what could be more mundane than stairs? Yeah. Now they're meaningful. Eating lunch, it's just food. But when we do it in this way, now it's an expression of our, you know, teammates and, and of our sense of a team. 
you could probably write a, a book or an encyclopedia or a many, many volumed work on the rituals around food. Some of them are religious, of course. Many of them are um, cultural. But it's remarkable how little food is used for sustenance. You write about Soylent, the product Soylent, and um, we almost nobody looks at food as a way to uh, stay alive. You Only. know, the w when people say, um, I don't have any rituals, I don't, I don't do any rituals. Um, uh, there's a couple of questions that I'll ask. So, so one is just, um, have you ever um, made a cake and very carefully frosted the cake so it looks really, really good? And then as soon as you finish frosting the cake perfectly so it looks really, really good, stuck a bunch of candles in it <laughs> and lit them on fire so that the wax burns down onto the perfect cake, then put it in front of a kid who's probably sick and have them blow all over the cake to blow the candles out and then eat the cake. And people say, well, yeah, I mean, I've done that. And I say, does it make a lot of sense, you know, to ruin the cake, quote unquote, ruin the cake like that? You say, well, no, but it's a birthday, right? It's a celebration. So we're taking the cake. And I mean, I like cake. Cake's delicious, but it's not just cake. It no. becomes something very different and very meaningful. And we're even willing to kind of ruin, I'm exaggerating, but ruin the food yeah. in order to get the ritual out of it, because that's really what's so important uh, when we're consuming the cake. But the order and with, with which we eat stuff. The, In fact, a lot of rituals are, I think, done to take away this, the nutritional aspect of food only, right? They're designed to slow us down. Right, it's polite. I think in America, I don't do it. I'm a, I'm a, uh, a philistine. Um, you know, to to switch hands with your knife and fork, so you have to put the knife down after you've cut, and then pick up the fork, and then put the bite in your mouth. Uh, I always found that annoying. So, and I like to eat way too much, so I just cut away mm -hmm. and eat. But there are many things like that. Certain traditions and customs of of etiquette that are designed to elevate the nature of food. Uh, I, I assume. For sure. Another um, example that I love because it's across so many cultures is, um, have you ever taken a glass filled with a liquid and raised it up into the middle of the table and banged it against other people's glasses and said a one or two word phrase <laughs> before <laughs> you drank the liquid? People say, of course. And whatever country they're from, I say, what do you say? Different words in every country, but they usually mean health or luck or something else positive when people say this, a celebration. It's, you know, it's beer, whatever's in the glass, it's just a liquid in a sense, if we go really basic. But by doing the clink thing, what are we doing? We're changing it into something very, very different. It's a little quick opportunity to basically say, I like everybody here. <laughs> you know, I wish the best for all of you before we drink the liquid. It's just liquid in a glass, but we, and you mentioned tea earlier, that's just liquid in a glass. But we're able to build so much emotion and meaning into these things. It's completely fascinating to me how much we use food and drink for all of these other goals. I've been told we clink glasses to show that we're not afraid that the liquid's poisoned and that some of my glass drink, some of my drink will get into your glass and vice versa. That has never happened to me in my life, as far as I know. <laughs> and I suspect that's one of those too good to be true stories, but I have heard that. And that's one way of elevating the emotional mm -hmm. uh, resonance of merely drinking. It reminds me of a possibly also apocryphal story about the origin of handshaking, mm -hmm. which was that when you extend your arm to shake hands with your enemy, it would cause any hidden daggers to fall out of your sleeve <laughs> so that you you could show them that you weren't going to stab them. It's I doubt it's you know exactly true like that, but I do think the fact that we even come up with these stories is quite interesting in and of themselves. But, of course, the flip side is also true. By grasping your hand, I am uh, allowing you to have some level of control over me and vice versa. Um, I'm reminded of the uh, the great Tim Conway in a skit on Carol Burnett when he greets um, Harvey C Corman, who who is a f a fellow um, slave on a Roman ship. Uh, Conway's the newbie. He sits down next to Harvey and shakes his hand. And says, "Hi, I'm a leper." 
Uh, it's a joke that you can't make in uh, 2024. Mm. It's probably inappropriate. We may have to cut this out, folks. I don't know. Mm. Uh, but um, it, it, it's an example of how there's a certain level of trust in shaking hands akin to the clinking of glasses. Even just getting that close to someone. Physically, yeah. Requires an enormous <laughs> amount of trust and goodwill. Uh, so it's a risk that we take in order to show let's actually try to be amicable. And I thought one of the worst things about COVID was staying apart from people physically because we were afraid. Obviously, we didn't shake hands. In the beginning, we didn't shake hands because we thought it was passed maybe through touch. Later, we didn't shake hands because we didn't want to get that close to people physically. We wanted to be six feet apart. Um, and I found, you know, having studied ritual for so long, I, I found fascinating in COVID that you could just abandon the practice altogether. But what people do is they improvise, you know, so the elbow, exactly. You, we both just raised our elbows. Yeah. What, what an odd, odd behavior to hit elbows with someone <laughs> that you've never done in your life. Why do we do it? Because we still want some of that physical connection, some of that ritual. And we look at our bodies and say, is there anything else we can use that's safer than our hands? And we come up with elbows. So we start clinking elbows instead of shaking hands. Yeah, and it was remarkably uh, unconscious. It was not a... Nobody said, hey, you exactly. can do this. It just, it, everybody did it without thinking. Exactly. Uh, I, I I forgot, when we're talking about mourning, I wanted you to talk about Dan uh, Wegner and his, his funeral. Uh, tell us about Dan and uh, what happened at his funeral. Dan Wegner was a professor of psychology at Harvard and one of my uh, absolute academic heroes, both because he was brilliant and also because he was a wonderful mentor to the students and others that worked with him. Uh, and he, but he was also extremely silly at the same time, which was part of his charm. He always wore these giant, very loud Hawaiian uh, shirts to wear, you know, Harvard professors supposed to, you know, dress in a certain way with tweed patches or whatever it might be. And he said, absolutely not. He wore these Hawaiian shirts. And so at his memorial service, he asked that everybody wear <laughs> these crazy Hawaiian shirts to honor him. And he also just thought it would be funny. And he and his family had a tradition of collecting Groucho Marx glasses, you know, you know, the plastic things with the fake mustache, because his daughters liked them. And that's something they did as a family. So he also said, hey, would everybody mind wearing that as well? So you go into a funeral <laughs> expecting, you know, all black or all white, depending on your culture. And instead, you've got Hawaiian shirts and Groucho Marx masks on, on a bunch of the people there. And I think it shows, you know, uh, it's a somber occasion for sure. I mean, everybody was devastated to lose this wonderful person, but he wanted to make sure that it was also a celebration and also funny. And you can have both of those things happening at the very same time. Well, he was like Mike Brick, who we talked about earlier, because he was kind of at his own memorial service uh, very powerfully. Every Any memorial service that's any good, of course, has the person's memories there, but this is a pretty yeah. intense way to do it. How? What proportion? You were there? Yes. Did you wear the Hawaiian shirt? I did. Did you wear the glasses? I couldn't find any in time, actually. Hard to do on a short, on short notice. Yes, I really I wanted to, but many, many people had the full, uh, the full regalia, yeah. Half? At least, I would say at least half, yep. And did they keep the glasses and mustache nose combo on the whole time or did they just make an appearance and then take them off that's a great question i don't i don't remember actually some people for sure kept them the whole time i think a lot of people kind of represented you know that his wish was wear these wear the shirt and wear the glasses and i think it was i'm going to do this to honor him but maybe not keep it for the entire time yeah <laughs> i'm thinking about your toothbrush in question that start opened our conversation and I suspect within our audience, there's a pretty sharp divide between mm -hmm. people who think that the Hawaiian shirt, Groucho Marx thing was the greatest idea of all time versus those who find it appalling. Did people talk about it at the event and afterward? Yeah, I, don't, I didn't talk to anyone who thought it was in the camp of um, appalling, I guess I would say. But that's because they knew him. If you ask yes. people listening right now, what do you think of that? Does that sound like fun or appropriate? I think about some significant number would say, 
No. <laughs> I think also, you know, if you wandered in off the street and saw this and you said, what's going on in there? I doubt you would say probably a funeral. <laughs> you know? So I do, I do think there's some sense we have this schema of what grief should look like. And it can be hard sometimes to do something different from that schema. Uh, one of the best chapters in the book is uh, a great insight, built around a great insight, which is that rituals obviously usually connect us. Um, you know, we have a certain kind of turkey. Certain, it's cooked a certain way. And everybody, mm -hmm. everybody's house has a certain kind of turkey, cooked a certain way, served with a certain kind of stuffing, served with a certain kind of gravy or not, depending on the house. Uh, so rituals obviously bring us together. And yet, as you would point out, they also divide us. And I thought that was great insight. Well, how? how? How do rituals divide us? A, a common experience for uh, younger people is, um, but let's stick to the U.S. and Thanksgiving, for example. Uh, when you're 18, you've been doing Thanksgiving your whole life. You know, it's it's delivered to you by your family. And for many young people, it's kind of annoying. <laughs> you know, all these people are in the house. I don't even like turkey. You know, why do we have all this kind of stuffing? And I'm not a big deal. Until they have a significant other. And for the first time, they go to somebody else's Thanksgiving. And then they have the feeling, and they'll use this word, they're doing it wrong. <laughs> That's what they say. You know, the turkey is the wrong, prepared wrong. They don't have this pie. Who eats it this time? You're supposed to eat it this time. Why is there football on? Or why is there not football on? <laughs> and it really shows you that, oh, I, my way, I didn't even realize it, but I actually do think that my family's way is the correct way to do Thanksgiving, and these other families are doing it incorrectly. You see this, of course, in interfaith relationships and interfaith marriages where you have religious differences that have to be ironed out and compromised. And so you do see that these same rituals that can be very meaningful and connecting at the very same time can start to divide us from other people because sometimes our rituals don't just feel good to us, they feel right. They feel correct. And that feeling can be very, very corrosive because if I'm correct, any deviation, to use your word, any deviation is a violation. And therefore, I'm upset about it and something must be done about it. And at the level of Thanksgiving, of course, you can see it happening. And obviously, you can see it in what happens in the world where religions with different practices are in conflict for many reasons. But one is actually the practices themselves you're it's almost you're not doing it correctly we're doing it correctly yeah for sure uh let's close with some advice um what i i liked a lot of things about your book but one of the things i liked is it sensitizes you to the rituals in your life i'm a religious jew i have way too many rituals for most people um they come effortlessly to me and i i think there's a really interesting question of uh you suggest at one point i think that religion and rituals can bring self-control. I also think it goes the other way. Uh, you do have so many requirements often in your religion that you're desperate to break out somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And if it's legal and within the religion, you're going to take advantage of it. So I think it's kind of it's kind of complicated. But one of the things <laughs> your book does is it uh, it forces you to realize that whatever things you know of as rituals in your life, you have others that you don't recognize that are rituals also. Uh, other than that sensitivity, do you have any advice for our listeners about ritual in their life? I do think um, noticing your own is fantastic. If you still are thinking, I don't have any, I would encourage you to ask your children or your spouse <laughs> or your coworkers, and they may have a different view of the various interesting behaviors that you have. So one quick one is for sure, look at, you know, be sensitive to your own. Another one is do a little research with the people who know you best and see what's happening. And then I think the final one is to think of rituals as something that um, they're tools that you can play with. They're not only the ones that are received through time or through religion, although again, those are incredibly important and meaningful in people's lives, but that we can also flexibly try our own rituals with our own family, with our own kids at bedtime, think about playing with them a little bit. When you try these out, you might find that it's a waste of your time. It didn't do anything for you. But sometimes when you try these things out, they become the practices that actually end up having a lot of meaning for you. And you're going to be saying goodnight to the stairs <laughs> for the rest of your life because you tried that out and it ended up being something very special with you and your family. 
My guest today has been Michael Norton. His book is The Ritual Effect. Michael, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you so much, Russ. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.